we would like to do it in a friendly manner. We recognize that there is that debt, which is legal, and we need to recognize that. The only way that that debt could be repaid is would be if we take power. If Maduro remains in power, we'll never get paid. We'll never get paid. Never. But we need to restrict that, taking in consideration our needs as a Venezuelan person. We need to stop the suffering of the people again. And, and finally, the social sector of the social area, we have 87% of, of, of poverty. So we need to create wealth and resources. But part of that wealth and resources have to go to those people to put it in the same line in order to take advantage of the opportunities that we can create. Otherwise, we, we will have social instability. So we need to keep that in mind, be clear on that. That's what we want to do for the future of Venezuela. I'm pretty confident that the future is there. <coughs> I think Venezuela is coming. Uh, we will need the international community in order to restore our economy, to restore our democracy, to have fair and transparent election. It's the time to do it. Venezuela is ready for a change. And let me give you this last sentence. They could extend their agony but we'll never be able to stop the change. Venezuela será libre nuevamente. Thank you very much. And uh, if I would like to invite the members of the panel, uh, Presidente Leon and uh, Michael Pimpo and uh, A lot to uh, to think about, a lot of issues there, um, and today, and now we're going to turn to our uh, panel of uh, experts to um, to talk about some of those issues and how we cross this river um, from one side to the other uh, and, and build a bridge that could be sustainable and democratic and, and peaceful, which uh, I think. Uh, uh, all of us in this room uh, would like to see. We have three outstanding experts on Venezuela who have kindly agreed to share their insights and knowledge and perspective on possible scenarios and possible implications of what's going on in Venezuela. Uh, from Caracas, two very good friends and highly respected analysts who have spoken at many dialogue events, uh, Michael Penfold and Luis Vicente Leon. Michael is a full professor of political economy and governance at IESA, Instituto de Estudios Superiores de Administración and Business and Public Policy School in Caracas. He's a visiting professor at the Universidad de los Andes in Bogotá. He's published widely and uh, specializes in the political economy of development. And he's the co-author of the book, Dragon in the Tropics, Venezuela, and the Legacy of Hugo Chavez, published by uh, the Brookings Institution. Luis Vicente Leon is president of Data Analysis, which is a position he's held since 1994. Uh, it's a survey database that specializes in global markets, and uh, its poll numbers are extremely credible and very reliable. Uh, Luis Vicente is also a professor at the Universidad Católica uh, Andres Bello, and also at IESA. He has degrees in economics and business, serves on many prestigious boards, and of course, he's widely quoted um, in the press on Venezuela and has been for, for many years. We're also very thrilled to have with us uh, Risa Grouse Targo, uh, who leads Eurasia Group's coverage of Venezuela. Uh, she works also on uh, Central American and Caribbean countries, but I think 
the deep, deepening crisis in economic and uh, political crisis in Venezuela has occupied most of her time. Uh, her sectoral expertise uh, includes the oil, gas, electricity, and mining sectors. She holds a master's degree in international economics from, from SAIS, uh, and previously worked at the U.S. Department of Treasury, Alcoa, and also the Albright Stormbridge Group. So welcome, Risa. Thanks, sir. Nice to have you back. I think we want to pursue another number of questions uh, with this panel, and let me just uh, just uh, just talk about them for a second, and then I'll turn to the panelists to try to address them. And then after their remarks, we'll of course invite and encourage your your participation in this uh, dialogue. Um, are conditions now right for a peaceful transition to democratic rule in Venezuela? Uh, are there obstacles? And if so, what are they? And how could they be best addressed? How do you assess the strategy of the National Assembly and the international community? Will Guaido be able to continue to strengthen his leadership and hold his supporters together? Will the, will the military eventually switch sides and will Maduro fold? Or will it stick together despite the intense domestic and international pressure? Is more widespread violence and even civil strife possible in Venezuela? Will the U.S. and other countries get pulled into a conflict in Venezuela? And what is the likely impact of the recently uh, announced uh, U.S. oil sanctions? Those are at least some of the questions uh, I think we'd like to cover. And um, I'd like to start by asking uh, Luis Vicente if he could talk a little bit about, first of all, give us the latest numbers. Uh, you have your finger on the pulse of uh, what the perceptions are about uh, how much support Maduro has, um, what's the sentiment about wanting uh, Guaido to continue as interim president and have this transition that Ambassador Vecchio laid out. Uh, and also, do you think a peaceful uh, transition, democratic transition, is is possible now? Is this the right time? And what do you see are the, are the prospects of that? Well, well, first of all, thank you for, for your invitation. Um, we don't have the, the last national poll. We are in the field right now because normally we we wait a little bit in order not to uh, do, to explore noises. We need some time, and, and we are in the field right now, so we we are finishing next week. But we have conducted three uh, different telephone uh, phone uh, calls in order to just create hypotheses. What is happening for a while, and I think. Nothing uh, surprised us, which is the most important information is, of course, the Guaido leadership. And this is, for me, the most important thing. Ma Maduro went down in terms of popularity, no, for at least three years ago. And, and he had about 20% popularity for more than three years. Sometimes 22, sometimes 18, but he was clear minority from the last three years in Venezuela. And this is not changing. The, the, maybe the change is that he's going to lose three, four, or five percentage points. But it means 20 or 15. It means he is still a minority. And the majority of the people in Venezuela reject the government of Maduro and is you know, supporting the possibility of changes. But what is interesting or different right now than in the last year is that in, in the polls in December, uh, even though almost 80% of Venezuelan, Venezuelans want changes, um, for example, the National Assembly, elected by the people, and the most important institution of opposition, just had 17% of support in December. Because the people got so frustrated in the last two years, not just with the National Assembly, but with the result of the action in the position. Uh, for example, with 80% of the people rejecting Maduro, the most important leader in the opposition, and it was more or less tied, the, the three most important leaders had uh, just about 20 to 25% of support. So if you take into account that 80% of Venezuelans 
wanted changes, but the most important leader in the position had just 25%, you can realize that the, op the institutional opposition had a problem in order to organize the, the people against Maduro actions or whatever. It changed dramatically in the last course. Why? Because why not appears. Uh, in fact, I have to say that maybe we can call it a leadership uh, in, in the right moment. Yeah. I mean, maybe the people is not saying us that they love Guaido because they know him. Uh, three weeks ago or one month ago, nobody knew who Guaido was. And now uh, the people, or the majority of the people in the position love him and think that he is the, the, the new hope, the leader, and they, they want to follow him. Why? Well, because if you take into account that in the past they wanted changes, but they were, you know, no link with the traditional opposition leaders, political parties, or institutions, they in fact were looking for an outsider. And Guaido, even though he is not an you know, outsider, because he comes from the political side, for them is new, fresh, young, different. And, and these conditions were enough to create a kind of new leadership and create some hopes in the people. And this is an enormous change. Uh, you know, the, the opposition change uh, in comparison to the last year. The, 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 of course, the National Assembly is winning uh, support as well. It's a start. Uh, recovering part of the support that the people in Venezuela gave to them when they was elected four uh, years ago. Um, well, this is the, the new situation. Guaido, as an important leader, the people, you know, creating new hopes, uh, esperanzas of changes for, for the future, and the National Assembly as a new important institution. But it's important to understand that what we have right now in Venezuela in order to answer your second question is that we are right now in a classic conflict of power. So we are not in front right now. We are not in front of any election. So we are not measuring because we want to know who is going to win an election because we are not facing any election right now. So the, the popularity of Guaido is important in terms of the support that he can obtain for his conflict of power against Maduro. And, and it's important to understand that we have Maduro in power and Guaido as a challenger. Why this is important? Because in, in order to create the strategies to produce changes, to, to have to understand who is in power and who is the challenger. It doesn't matter if we recognize or not why go as a president? The reality is that the control of the territory is in Maduro's hands right now. It doesn't matter the you know, adjectives, uh, if it's legal or illegal, legitimus or not, he is controlling the territory. He's the one who controls the police. He's the one it can put people in jail or not, or you know, free uh, them. Is the one controlling the customs, the one controlling the taxes, is the one controlling the infrastructure and PDVSA inside right now. The challenger is Guido, and he has a lot of important assets in order to be a challenge. Popularity, people, the, the, the majority want wanting changes, which is important, and of course the international community. But not just the international community. The international community is so important in terms of elevate the cost of the status quo. Yeah. The cost of Maduro to maintain power without changes, negotiations, or elections, or whatever, is of course increasing because the, the action in the international community. But it's special the action of the United States, which is the most important one in terms of the international community. Why? Well, because the actions, for example, with the facto embargo of oil that we have right now, affect dramatically the economy of Venezuela, taking account that almost 50% of the barrels that Venezuela export comes here to the United States and is going to be affected with the embargo. And it means about 75% of the income produced
use for, from oil because it's, you know, the, 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 the petroleum who can ask money for. So, United States has a lot to do in terms of these actions in the international community. And Guaido and the opposition count on them. But what has Maduro in order to, you know, to put himself on the table to fight to the, to the conflict of power? Maduro has two important things. Well, of course, some countries, some allies, and we can discuss if they are so important or not, but they have some allies, as Russia, for example, Turkey, uh, uh, Russia, uh, China, uh, um, Mexico, etc. Uh, in different levels, but you know they are not rejecting at least Maduro. But the most important asset for Maduro is the military, the military sector inside, which is so important. Well, because it's the way he has in order to maintain power. Maduro is president right now, not because he is a majority, not because he is recognized for the rest of the world. He is president right now because he is supported by the military in Venezuela. It could change in the future. Yes, of course. It's volatile, it, it could change, uh, there are many risks for them, but what, what is clear in this very moment, in a tra transversal cut, is that he is counting with the military right now. So, what is more important? Um, in the short term, it's so important to analyze what is going to happen with the military. If the military decide, you know, to abandon Maduro, Maduro is going to be in real troubles. Uh, he is going to be out of power without the military support right now in Venezuela. The question is, is possible that the military decide to, you know, to be apart, fracture, implosion against Maduro? Well, uh, if you check, for example, the actions of the United States in order to create you know, the embargo, etc., the, the first strategy, which is so interesting and important, is to create a kind of collapse, the economic collapse in order to destabilize Maduro and create the possibility of fracturing inside the military and create changes in Venezuela. This is the threat. No, create collapse. Um, it could work. Well, it's a strategy. Of course, it could work. And, and it's a scenario. The, the thing is that we have another scenario, and we have to analyze it in, in the rest of the conversation. But uh, uh, there are other scenarios. If What happens if you create the economic collapse bad the military decide to maintain sustaining Maduro. Uh, it's possible to, you know, to, that, to have this scenario. Well, this is an awful scenario, but it's a possible one. We, we have in a different uh, stories, different conditions, but we have this for something cool. Uh, it was a, a, a classical example about a country in the middle of a mess, but maintaining power by force. The second is, it's possible to fracture the military just for create collapse, or you need to negotiate with them? It's a second question. If you can negotiate with them, for example, Guaido is always talking to a very important issue about the amnesty law. When he talks about the amnesty law for the military, in fact, he's proposing a negotiation with the military, trying to say to them, hey, if you abandon Maduro and get apart, you are going to be, you know, without uh, big issues or problems or whatever. This is a kind of negotiation. The problem is that in order to be success with a negotiation with the military, you need, in reality, to, to have trust. They have to trust on you, on institutions who uh, are absolutely clear are going to defend the agreement that you made. And a law of uh, an amnesty in Venezuela without institutions and we, we, without knowing what is going to happen in the future, even if we have changes in the government, is not enough to get trust from the military. The third is, who is the guy who can create some area of negotiation with them? We have different uh, proposals on the table. Uh, people who said, no, no, we cannot negotiate. We need an intervention. The people say, no, no, you need to negotiate with the military face to face and create some, for example, international grant to fracture them 
and have some peaceful change. And the people who think that you have to negotiate even with Maduro in order to recover that. I am not, uh, I'm going to stop here just to put on the table the three uh, different options that we are discussing at least in the Great. Thank you very much. That was, that was terrific. Um, I'm going to turn to a, a, another on-the-ground perspective from Michael Pinfold, and then we'll go to Risa after that. But I, I was wondering, Michael, if you um, can kind of, uh, if you agree with the scenarios that we specifically have laid out, and you assign different degrees of probability. Um, and also, I think we should get to the question, and perhaps you can address it, of what Carlos Svecchio said, which is that there is in coming days, going to be uh, delivery of humanitarian aid, uh, food and medical supplies and the like to Venezuela. Uh, that means coming into Venezuela. And if you could just tell us how you see that happening in practical terms. Um, and again, this goes to Luis Vicente's point about the military. Is this gonna be a showdown that's really gonna reveal how the military behaves, is this the real test? So if you could just kind of respond to that and also just take on that question. Well, first of all, first of all, well, thank you, Michael Howard, for the introduction and the invitation. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's, it's like a second home for me. Um, it's always been a, a great place to have these kinds of discussions. Um, and more so in this historical time in, in Venezuela. Um, let me start saying that from a domestic perspective, most of us believed that January 10 was an important date, um, that it would have consequences. But we never expected the, the size of, of this democratic movement that we've seen in the last few weeks in Venezuela. And such a fast recovery in terms of leadership and, and, and vision of, of where the country should move forward. Personally, I think independently of how you see the future and the scenarios, for me, the key question here is, is Maduro gonna be able, even if he stays in power, reverse this to where he was prior to January 10th? And I think the question, the answer to that question is no, it's irreversible. Um, at this point, I think that there are many changes, and I wanna highlight some of them, that make you think that independently of what you see in the future, whether he stays or not, the country changed. Why? First of all, I think Maduro underestimated hugely the situation he was stepping into. Um, and he overestimated his capabilities to deal with that situation. I think he was ready to pay a high international cost for what he was doing in terms of, of, of how he was trying to stay for his, for a, in a legitimate way for his second uh, presidential uh, period. Um, but the fact is that the cost, surprisingly, was not international, it was domestic. Um, he never expected that the opposition was able to solve its collective action problem so quickly. He never expected the, the domestic response in terms of, of people in supporting the change. Second element that I think is, makes this baseline different from what we've seen in the past, which has to do with the new leadership that we be saying it was mentioning. I mean, you know, this is a country where there's very few media, independent media outlets. This is a country where three million people have left the country. It's quite amazing. I mean, the size of that migration. And despite you know all those limitations, in matters of two weeks, you had a new leadership, um, and you had people that I think were marching and protesting in the streets peacefully, um, despite all those limitations. And that's impressive. That's a, a very important distinction, too. Third, Chavismo demobilized. This is the most surprising element when you look at the situation. And here you have 
a very important political movement. I mean, I'm not saying that you know they they do not that this is not an, a relevant political actor. It is, but it did not. It decided not to mobilize around Maduro at a time where they're facing the quote unquote imperial threat. Why? And I think it has to do with the fact that, and this is the other element, that they're perceiving that the situation in the economic and social front is so dire, so difficult, that you know perhaps there is a problem with the leadership. Um, there is a problem in terms of how this leadership is going to be able to solve very basic problems. And this is the final element that is distinct from any other episode which is the size of the economic crisis, um, of the economic depression. January, inflation rate on a monthly basis was 240%. This is huge. I mean, this is devastating. Um, and it's, it's not only the acceleration of the inflation, it's a combination of that acceleration with the crisis in public services. So you have people in, in, in the poor areas that do not have regular access to okay, cooking gas, gas of, to, to cook well, gas for cooking. Um, so that's created a huge social pressure. So I think all of these elements make this, the current situation different. Um, and, and I think it's important to take it in mind because I think that no matter how you see this, at the end, as, as, as uh, Luis Vicente was saying, the demand for change is very important. Now, I like to think about the future right now, not in terms of scenarios, to be very honest. I like to think about it in terms of what are the key factors here. And I think there are several key factors. First key factor has to do with the military. Now, to be very honest, no one knows exactly what's going on with the military. It's a black box. But do we know? We know, first of all, it's not your classical institution. It's a corporation. It's, 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 it's a group that owns and controls, basically, the oil sector, mining sector, most state and land enterprises, and is vested also in illegal trade. So, so you have a very powerful actor. Now, many people say, well, they are loyal. Yeah, so far they have been loyal. It's true. But so far also, they're not doing exactly what the regime would have wanted them to do. So what does that mean? I think this is a big question mark, a big element. There are hypotheses. Some believe it's, it's a fracture that is already in. Um, and therefore, because this is an institution or, or slash corporation that's, that is adverse to conflict, that you know they want to minimize that internal conflict as much as they can. Others believe that probably they're starting to work more as an arbiter in order to protect their, their interests. Um, and therefore, a, a, this issue of amnesty that, that was mentioned becomes important because they are saying, this is not enough. This probably is not enough for us um, to cave in. Second key factor here has to do with time. And there is this vision I think it's a classical vision within the government, which is let's use the same repertoire we've used in the past. Let's wait. Let's time pass by, and you know, and then this will basically go away. This movement will just go away. Perhaps that's true. I'm not. I, I'm really not sure that that doesn't apply anymore. But I also think that conditions have changed. That this demand for change is so strong, and the current situation is are, are so dire, that the idea of time also makes the government look less and less viable over time. 50 days ago, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we all thought, yes, you know, perhaps Europe would cut diplomatic relationships with Venezuela. We all thought that could happen. We never thought they would recognize uh, uh, you know, Guaido as the legitimate government. Now, we all thought that 
you know, a Maduro was going to pay a very high cost for taking the oath as he did without, you know, the constitutional, as, as a constitution established. But we never thought that 20 days after, he would have a competing authority that was challenging that, that power. So time, I think, is, is a factor that we need to, to look at, and it's not clear to me exactly how this is going to play. I do think it's a key variable. Why? Because as time passes by, the economic depression is going to get deeper, and it's going to get deeper because the kind of, of, of constraints that you're facing are tremendous. Just think about this in the oil sector. You're a supplier to the oil sector in Venezuela. Look at Reliance from India. Look at Look Oil from Russia. Let's forget about the US firms. Just start to look at, at, at <coughs> firms that are linked or have vested interests in the current situation. They've said, we can't do business like this. It's impossible for us. So, you know, the whole situation is going to deteriorate very sharply, particularly in the oil sector. Now, that time is a key factor. The third key factor is how is the population politically going to respond to you, the military need? Because the truth is, not only will the military allow it to go through or not, but the truth is that there is a demand for this. There is, there is a demand. So the question is, is this response, how is this response going to be taken? Is it going to be large enough to be noticed? Or is it going to be just, you know, very small? You know, this is a key question. <coughs> this drives me to my last point, which is, why haven't we seen the final change? What's going on if this is this process is, is, has been so fast and so unexpected in many ways. I think that the basic problem is, and this is where Guaido, I think, has been superb, has been basically. He's saying, look, these are three faces with three different objectives. He's being very good at communicating and communicating expectations around each one of these faces and around the obstacles to solve the problem for each one of these faces. But I think at the end, what he's, when he's saying, well, we need first to end usurpation to go into the transition. Well, the problem there is that you need an offer that is attractive to do it. That is, you need a landing place for everyone that provides guarantees for everyone because the uncertainty is very high. The interests at play are very high. Um, the potential costs um, and gains are huge. So people don't know exactly where they're going to end up in that in that game. You ask me, for example, going back to my initial claim about one thing that I was impressed by what was going on in the grounds so is the fact that the Chavismo is not being able to mobilize. They, they're not being willing to mobilize. Well, my view is that. Chavismo, I think, at the end, they would play the transition without Maduro if they have enough guarantees that they will be able to influence and shape that process. And perhaps, we don't know, that's also happening with the armed forces. At the end, you need to design a landing place. The question is, do you want a paved landing place or a non paved landing place. I would like a paved landing place. And the reason is that it's a temporary place and we're going to have to take off again in order to recover the country. What does it entail recovering the country? Creating institutions. This is a country that is lacking rules. We're not going to be able to restore economic growth if these rules are not credible. This is the biggest role of the transition if we manage to step into this process. Can it go wrong? Yes, it can go wrong. Will it go wrong? We don't know. 
what I'm sure is that in this process, so far, so far, the government has made enormous mistakes. Why? Because they're underestimating the situation, they're overestimating the problem. And so far, the opposition and Weibo have been able not to commit as many mistakes. They have committed some, but not as many. Now, net, you have this process of change going, but this is going to require enormous craft, enormous craft. My final, final comment, remark. Look, I've studied throughout the last 20 years many democratic transitions throughout the world. I've read about them. You know, I did my PhD studying them. Um, and to me, I've never seen something like this in a country where the transition is centered around a national assembly. This is what is unique about the potentiality of Venezuela's democratic transition. You know, in countries you have transitions that are led by social movements, others, you know, that happen because there's a coup, others because, you know, you have leaders that emerge that have the credibility. But my God, you've never seen a country where this transition is led by a parliament. And I think that's unique. And that's the biggest asset the opposition has. Because at the end, any solution, any solution, goes through that institution. Um, and so I'll leave it there. But I think it's important to capture what is different um, and what are the challenges that, that Venezuela has um, in order to, to really produce um, and, and move forward the country towards democracy. It's also true, I think, that the assembly three weeks before, you know, in December, nobody talked about this. And so it's not only the National Assembly is playing the role, but that it happened so quickly. It's funny. I mean, that's, you know, everybody can't say well, it's a more bomb institution and didn't have any strength, and all of a sudden it's now at center stage. So thank you for that. Uh, Risa, um, if you could just tell us a little bit about what you're, you're telling your clients. Are you telling them what Michael and his Vicente have said? And uh, I know that Eurasia always likes, at least they used to like putting percentages on on uh, what's the, percent, the likelihood in actually attaching percentages numbers. If you could, if there are percentages that are interesting, if you want to reveal those uh, to us, that would be great. So if you could just give us a general sense about Sort of where things are, but also uh, talk a little bit about the, the sanctions and uh, to what extent do you think the, uh, the trade in, in crude and, and refined products will continue uh, at all between Venezuela and the United States? Sure, thank you. Thank you for the, the invitation. I mean, so I've actually been burned so many times on calling Maduro's downfall that I'm not putting a probability on it this time. But um, no, I would tend to to agree that it looks very hard for, for Maduro to work his way out of this one. I mean, in terms of the, the confluence of, of variables right now, with the immense international pressure, a unified opposition, mobilizations in the streets also kind of starting to spread into typical bastions of, of government support, um, and the, the economic situation right? That's, uh, that, that, Michael, that Michael mentioned. I think the U.S. sanctions are going to have a very important impact on the, the economic outlook in the very near term. And I, I think they have, that has implications for internal unity and these questions about the military sticking with Maduro, but also for the calculations of international actors. And so I want to I touch on that in terms of some of those allies that, that Luis Vicente was mentioning. So the, the U.S. sanctions announced last week are very aggressive. On paper, they say that you can still, PDVSA can still do business with the U.S., but any money from that goes into an account that they can't touch. Same thing with CITCO, so it's a de facto import ban. And the U.S. is really the only, at this point, or only meaningful cash-generating export market that the government has. Um, they've also lost CITCO, um, essentially, and they've lost access to imports of lighter crudes and diluents that PDVSA needs to make its very heavy crude commercially viable. They were sourcing around half of that from the United States, 
they can find other suppliers. But uh, in general, I think finding new suppliers and new markets is gonna be very, very difficult. The new markets, the potential options are China and India. Those are the only markets where that have refineries that can process Venezuela's fruit outside of the Gulf Coast. Um, they're gonna have to charge a very steep discount to compete with the Middle Eastern crudes that are currently being processed there. Um, there's also been some concerns I know on the India side about quality. Um, and then there's just logistical concerns, there's transportation costs, there's uh, you know the, how quickly you can get these contracts turned around. But beyond those two issues, which are, which are very big in terms of even the starting point of sanctions, I wanna go back to what Michael mentioned, which is that this whole universe of companies that have exposure to PDVSA, which are which are taking precautions. So these are primary sanctions. It's just on PDVSA. It's just for U.S. entities. But the universe of upstream, midstream, downstream companies that have either assets in the U.S. or uh, exposure to the U.S. payment system is massive. And so. These are kind of primary sanctions that are starting to look like they have a very, very long shadow in terms of how companies behave. And so we had Luke Oil last week saying they're gonna cancel their contracts, other traders doing the same. And the government has about two weeks of inventory in terms of these lighter crudes to mix, in terms of gasoline, uh, which is also huge on the on the social uh, side. Um, so this, you know, if, OFAC doesn't license this away or workarounds don't kind of present themselves in the very near term, I think beyond the, the cash flow hit, which is going to be enormous, we're also going to see a real impact on production, um, which has already been hit dramatically over the past couple of years. Um, obviously, this has, I think, very important implications for Maduro's internal support and the degree to which the military and other actors around him feel like this is sustainable because I think for the military in, in particular, I think the only way you get regime change is in addition to having amnesty, credible off ramps, you really have to feel like there's no other alternative, that Maduro's regime is truly unsustainable. But if there's no dollars coming into the country and your one kind of non-illicit source of revenue is disappearing, I mean, that's a that's a huge problem in terms of his internal support and I think contributes with all these other variables to that sense of kind of inevitability or can we go back from here that, that Michael was, was touching on. Finally, I just wanna mention what the US sanctions mean for some of these other international actors. I think the Trump administration really went all in in terms of the sanctions options. A lot of us were expecting a more gradual escalation starting with maybe a, a partial ban on some parts of you know diluents escalating eventually to an import ban and they move decisively and very aggressively. And so that means, I think it sends a strong signal to everyone else, the international community, that they're very focused on regime change, that they really want to force this issue. Um, and also it leaves not that many options for further escalation besides military intervention, which is something that the Trump administration continues to hint at. And I think that has very important implications for how Venezuela's traditional allies like Russia and China behave going forward. I personally think that, I mean, China, we've already seen a shift in strategy over the past several years. They've really kind of backed away. Um, the statements coming out of Beijing have been much more kind of cautious over the past few days. They say, we're talking to everyone. And I think their principal concern is getting repaid. But even Russia, who has generally, you know, Putin, I think this is a geopolitical play for him. He loves having this kind of uh, foothold in, in the Western Hemisphere. Um, it's economic opportunism. He, you know, Rosneft has gotten great deals over the past several years. But in a context in which the Trump administration is explicitly threatening military escalation, is he suddenly going to continue to send you know, Russian bombers there as a signal of his support? Is he going to ex increase his, his economic exposure? I don't think so. So I think in that sense, the Russians, the, I think Russia, the Chinese, other potential allies, I think this also changes their calculations in terms of their, uh, their willingness to go all in to, to defend the regime. Um, and that makes it harder, honestly, for them to, to sustain themselves going forward. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Rashad. Okay. Thank you very much.
Uh, let me just do a quick follow-up uh, question, just for like one or two, one minute, if you could, and then we'll open it up to all of you. I know all of you are anxious, you're already very impatient and sitting on the edges of your seats. Uh, please be sent out. I'd like to ask you about the opposition and related to this question of amnesty, off-ramp, all of this, you know, so what's the, what are the terms of any kind of potential arrangement? Is this um, is Guaido so popular and so loved, and is uh, sort of the, the, the opposition so unified, uh, and the momentum so strong, that when these issues, when you start to talk about these issues, do you see the opposition uh, sort of holding together on what the terms might be of an amnesty, or whether an off-ramp, and how their sense about how much justice they will demand. Uh, are there differences, or do you just think basically everybody just is, wants to get rid of Maduro and whatever terms are come up, they'll go along. If that if Guaido supports them, they'll go along. Yeah. Well, uh, the, the opposition in it is, is very interesting right now uh, because of Guaido. You know, Guaido become important and popular, and it's difficult to be against them. Uh, unity is a very you know, volatile thing in, in Venezuela and specifically in the opposition. Uh, in honest, for example, when when we all stand in, in in front of the people, the rest of the opposition didn't agree. No, they, they didn't want to do it this thing. And they have made an, an agreement in order not to do it. And we all decide to do it even without the approval of the rest of the leaders. But no, because uh, they are going to look for different things. And the other important thing is about uh, the negotiation of amnesty or uh, the relation with the media. Uh, Report it in this way. Uh, talking about transitions, as, as Michael said. If you uh, take into account transitions, you have to control two important things. In order to be successful, you have to increase, to maximize the cost of the status quo. It means you have to do everything in order to increase the cost of Maduro to maintain power. And this is what is happening right now. And I think has, has, done, has happened a lot of things. The international community, the leader, unity, the embargo, uh, the crisis, the collapse. We don't have any, for example, uh, uncertainty about if the United States could create an economic collapse in Venezuela. This is not uncertainty. This is absolutely clear. They could do it, of course, they could do it. The uncertainty is if the economic collapse caused the change of the government. This is the uncertainty, not a collapse. The collapse is absolutely clear. And what is going to happen after the collapse? Who is going to be affected the most? Maduro or the people? And, and of course, time is going to be so important for this. Because uh, I know you are living here, but we live in Venezuela. So in three months, you can talk about economic collapse as a you know paper thing. But for us, is leaving the collapse with our kids there, without electricity or power, sorry, or water or food or medicine. So if nothing happened, the only important thing is the crisis for us. And this is a risk, because in three months, maybe the people who is very happy and supporting why not? if nothing happened, maybe in three months, living a huge crisis, they are going to start thinking that, hey man, nothing happened and we are worse. Who is the guilty one? This is a risk, a clear risk. So time is important for this reason in my opinion. But the second, by the way, the first, and everybody's talking about that, you know, the cost of exit, the cost of uh, uh, status quo, there's a lot of work and a very good one. But the second is the cost of exit. You have to minimize the cost of exit in order to be successful. You have to, to give them the opportunity to allow, change, allow changes and, and if they don't think that they are safe, it's going to be more difficult, even 
in the middle of the collapse because they control arms, they can create repression, and it's not uh, uh, in terms of popularity or majority, it's worse inside. Of course, again, I don't have any uncertainty if the United States could, could uh, take Maduro out by force. <laughs> this is not an uncertainty. The uncertainty is if you decide to do that without control the cost of exit and do it against the military sector in Venezuela without offering them to be safe, or is it possible in a scenario of anarchy? They could go to the street with their arms to fight because other way they are going to be destroyed by the new world. No, at least, at least we have to ask the questions. So it's not just if Maduro is out, is how are you going to do it? Because the methodology and the agreement that you create is very important to think what is going to be the stability in the future for the new government and for the country. Thank you. Uh, Michael, if I could ask you, based on your knowledge of transition, you talked about the special feature of the National Assembly, but also just, just following up on Luis Vicente's comment, uh, you know, some people are talking about the Jericho tendency, you know, the, you sort of push hard, you pressure, and the walls come tumbling down. Um, do you, is there anything in your, based on your knowledge of any kind of transition where this has really happened so quickly? There seems to be an expectation, certainly I think in this city among some people and, and elsewhere, that this, all of this is going to sort of lead to the collapse and things will somehow kind of uh, transition will, will proceed fairly smoothly uh, and without, you know, these kinds of working out intense negotiations and all this. Is, that, is there any precedent for that uh, in your experience? Well, not, I mean, it's, it's a very, it's, a, it's definitely a very unique case of <clears throat> serving and the way how it's developing. And at the end, you know, all this pressure really is, is you, have to, you have to answer the key question is, well, will that, how will that key, that, that the intensity of that international and domestic pressure play out within the actor that seems to be the actor that might tip the balance in one direction or the other, um, which is the military, right? So there's one theory of change, there's several theories of change, but one theory of change is that that pressure is so intense that it, 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 it will in, inevitably break down. Well, so far it has been. So that's, you know, so what will it take? Will it take more pressure? Um, but that's one hypothesis, and if that happens, then you have this transition where you get, you know, rival, you get the National Assembly, you get the international support, and, and you have this sort of story of, of, of success that follows from that. Well, that's one path, right? It's just one. But what happens if it doesn't happen? What does it mean? Because here is one thing that, at least in my mind, I, I try to explain myself, and I have no idea because we have no information. Right? Which is, well, why isn't the military, despite all this pressure in the border, displayed completely? Why aren't they, as an institution, containing the popular discontent? Why are they delegating this to a, a other quasi-paramilitary groups, basically, um, that do not respond to them? Why? Is it because they're not willing to do that? Which means, well, if they're not willing to do that what, that, what does that mean? Does it mean that they're waiting for this paved landing place to appear? And what, you know, will it make attractive for them to, to land in that, in, that, in that place? This is what, you know, this is the whole story about, you know, what you offer, you know, cost of exits, or et cetera. So, 
for me, what's going, what's happening is that the context is putting the the military in a different position. One that it's not that they like, but increasingly they're going to have to arbitrate this whole situation. Now, when you try to arbitrate, you're going to exercise power, arbitrating. You don't exercise power, tumbling others. You 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 get your deal and then you act. So. That's one theory, that's a second theory of change, which entails for me two types of the negotiations, one with them and the other also with Chavismo, non maurista Chavistas, who also want a landing place. And that is, it implies important concessions in order for them to buy into this process that at the end has to be based on one element. It's the 1999 constitution. The reason why we are on this in the streets protesting has to do with the fact that the Constitution was dissolved. This is what unites the country at this, at this point. It's an alliance around the Constitution, the rules, building these institutions for this not ever to happen again in Venezuela. So that's the second thing. Now, it could happen that nothing happens and the country starts falling apart. It could happen. So there you go, you have Libya, you have territories, you have organizations, you have all these. So there my question is, well, if that starts happening, what is gonna be the international response to that? Um, and there, I do think that there is uncertainty. So what happens? So I think that those within the regime that are trying to resist basically want to move towards this third scenario. <laughs> That's where they think they can, you know, sort of play it out. It's very risky. It's a very risky uh, process. Does that does that mean? And I think there's this sort of mantra going on in Venezuela, which I honestly don't don't share. Which is, well, those risks are so high that you know, we better don't do anything about it. I think we should try at least to go through one of these first two paths in order to to move this process forward. Thank you. Uh, Risto, let me, let me ask you. One of, the, one of the reasons I understood for many years, I mean, this, this um, sort of sanctions on oil has been talked about for you know 15 years, uh, and now it's being implemented. But one of, the, one of the arguments I always heard that why it wasn't implemented was that it could affect the US domestic market and global markets that was so, so important. What, what do you think the impact is on the U.S.? Um, and, you know, are we going to be pay, paying more at the um, gasoline stations to fill up our cars? I mean, what, what effect does it have in the United States and also just globally, since Venezuela is such an important player? Yeah, so I would say the, the impact has, has certainly, the potential impact has diminished quite a bit over the past few years with the collapse in production. Um, and so, in terms of the, the importance of, of Venezuelan oil to, um, to the U.S. market, it's, it's diminished, um, even though Venezuela is still, I believe, tied for fourth in terms of, of suppliers of, of oil. Um, I think this is gonna, there's gonna be a marginal increase in costs, and certainly, you know, in terms of the timing here, oil sanctions were something that were on the table prior to the midterms, and I think it's it's not coincidental that Trump did, decided not to, to do that before the midterms, and that this this conversation really picked up um, only this year. But what what's now gonna happen is this kind of rearrangement of global flows where, um, in terms of the replacement barrels that will come to the Gulf Coast refineries, um, the main places are that have similar types of oil are, are Canada, um, in terms of their heavy oil, but there there's some real midstream issues in terms of getting the oil to the Gulf Coast. Um, it has to come by rail, um, and that's a, that's a challenge. Um, or the Middle East, but again, that's basically gonna require some displacement of Middle Eastern flows that are going to Asia, uh, coming to the US, um, and some kind of reorganization there. So um, in terms of the kind of Compensation for Venezuelan supply. Well, Mnuchin said actually when he unveiled the sanctions that our friends in the Middle East were going to help us out on this. So maybe there's some some deal with the Saudis um, um, behind closed doors. But um, but I think what we're going to see is basically the Middle Eastern barrels and these heavier Canadian barrels coming in to make up 
the, this, the loss to Venezuelan supply um, with certainly some cost for refiners. And I think at least in the, if you temporarily a marginal increase in, in, in cost here. But um, again, going back to my point before, I think the fact that, you know, despite all the, the pressure from the U.S. refining lobby, concern about, um, you know, the increase in domestic oil prices, I mean, I think the fact that the Trump administration decided to do this, again, speaks to their their commitment here in forcing the issue. And their timetable. And their timetable. <laughs> Going back to the issue of time. Right. Great. Terrific. Okay. Uh, this has been great. Let's open it up. Just please wait for a microphone. Uh, tell us who you are. And please be very uh, brief. Let's go in the back there. This, this, yeah. Yes. Yes, true. Let's collect a few questions. Hi, um, I'm wondering, so uh, Tell us who you are. I'm Jeff Ramsey from the Washington Sun Latin America. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about the potential risks of uh, Iraqi landing, as you put it. I'm wondering uh, what what you all make of the reticence expressed today by Borges uh, with regards to the EU Latin America contact group. I understand nobody wants hollow dialogue, but there seems to be a pretty clear mandate or conditions to establish new credible presidential elections uh, out of this. No one's talking about uh, mediation or dialogue and any of that. So, wondering what you all make of the EU Latin America contact group. Great, thanks. Dan? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dan Erickson, Blue Star Strategies, great panel. Uh, in Carlos Vecchio's remarks, he mentioned Cuba twice, and at one time characterized the Venezuelan government as being totally controlled by Cuba. And then no one kind of picked up the threat at all in the panel. And I was just wondering, you know, how you see Cuba today? Is this a top five factor, top 10, top 20? Uh, how, how relevant is, is the Cuban government to support at this juncture? Yeah, why don't we go back? Is that Cindy? Yeah. Sorry. Thanks so much. Cindy Arnson Wilson Center. Um, my question is for Michael. In terms of providing the military and the armed forces um, with a guarantee that's more substantial than the amnesty given their multiple economic interests. At what point do you provide enough of a guarantee to them that in some way you threaten the very nature of the democratic transition? Great, I think we'll, uh, why don't we try Sonia and then we'll, we'll do another round real quick, but Sonia, and then we'll, people can just. Um, thank you, Sonia Schultz of International Consulting. I was wondering if the amnesty law or, uh, I don't know, the negotiations will cover Mr. Maduro. So how do you see the way out for him? Because he doesn't seem to be like uh, he's going to step uh, aside. So will be a golden exile, despite uh, many Venezuelans will be very upset with that, but it's a possibility. Thank you. Great, thank you. Why don't we start with Michael and then we'll go to Lisa and uh, this is <coughs> Well, I'll try to address uh, Jack's and Cindy's um, questions, and I'll leave uh, the other questions for, for Lisa and um, Lucy Saint. You know, negotiations, this one has tried that. We had two very important uh, negotiation process that failed with international mediation precisely at a time where Venezuelans were seeking either a recall referendum according established by the Constitution, which was blocked, and you know, and after the negotiation that was sparkled by that process, it failed shortly after, and we had the events that followed in 2017, first of all, by the, you know, take stripping away um, the National Assembly from its prerogative through the judiciary, um, and then the civic protests that started after that ruling by the judiciary, which ended up with huge uh, repressions and costs of the life. So that was our first experience. Second experience was Dominican Republic, okay. um, which is an you know, there would have not been January 10 had there not been Dominic the failure of Dominican Republic, had there not been May 20th. Okay, so these are elements that connect with each other. Okay. 
Dominican Republic started really well, the process, in, 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 in December. Um, most of the foreign uh, ministers that were coming along with, both from the, you know, close to, the, to, the, to Maduro and close to the opposition, it converged on a first proposal for free and fair elections. And the negotiation process that followed in January, February, and beginning of March was one where Maduro basically backscaled that initial agreement to a point where the opposition basically said, we cannot accept this. Now, Rodriguez Zapatero, rather than saying when, you know, when there was, a, 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 according to the government, there was a, an agreement that was ready to be signed, right? The opposition said, no, we're not signing that. Rodriguez Zapatero, in January, in, in March, rather than extending the process, which was the logical step if you're mediating, is, okay, we're not ready, let's keep trying, right? Particularly because time was not an issue. According to the Constitution, we could have held that election in December 2018. There was no rush. And notwithstanding, Rodriguez Zapatero said the negotiation is over. The government said we're going to our election on May 20th. You know, and then the election had this, this, this process by which not only the opposition that had participated in Dominican Republic said we don't recognize it, but the opposition that had participated on the May 20th election also said we don't recognize it. So that was a big failure, but the government, again, overestimated and underestimated its capacity, capability to deal with that, the May 20th consequences of that, of, that, of that election. And we had a third process that was not public, but that happened. Because, you know, we're like topos now in this country. We, you know, we, 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 we have to build tunnels in order to, you know, do some kind of political transactions as any normal society because of the situation is so dire. Right? And there was an agreement that was close to be, you know, there was a, a good one. It was better than Dominican Republic. And the government again, Maduro decided, we're not signing. We're not doing it. And then they decided to go to January 10. Because at the end, the government is not ready to accept the fact that alternability is important. Okay, that the issue at hand is that being in the opposition, losing elections in Venezuela has to stop being a tragedy. Being in the opposition is not for anyone to be condemned. And that's a problem in Venezuela. Being in the opposition is too costly. Okay. So this links to Cindy's question, which I think is terrific. Where do you draw the line? Well, you draw the line to a point where you're not compromising alternability and you're not compromising the basics of the rule of law in Venezuela. Um, this, is, that gonna, is that gonna entail some negotiations? Again, once Maduro has been, is out, yes, I think it will. Because we have to separate, in the case of Venezuela, the situation is so complicated. Yet you need to separate two problems. First problem is how you stabilize the economy, how you address the social emergency, and how do you deal with security, okay? That's government. You need to restore government, okay? You have to do that in a, in a very short period of time with the support of the multilateral institutions, to international donors, and all that. But there's a second issue, which is the transitional problem that you need to deal with. And, and that you need to create the conditions for that. And this I link with the EU a a proposal. EU is saying, we don't recognize Maduro. We recognize Guaido, but we want elections. Well, we don't want a, a long transitional a, government. Okay, the country has to deal with that. But it can only deal with that once you have move from this usurpation phase to the transitional phase. And that's what I think needs to be done in order for, for, for the negotiations to emerge again. If you do that, I'm sure it's gonna be in the interest 
of the terrorism, of the opposition, of the military, of citizens, of everyone in Venezuela to come up with a good deal for the country. But you need to solve the current uh, situation right now in order to move into that phase, not before. Negotiations at this point, I think, are uh, could be a, you know, it, there's no guarantee you're not gonna end up with the same outcome we've already saw in the past. And you know, I, I have been someone who has, in many ways, favored that kind of outcome. But I, quite honestly, I don't see it in, this, in, the, in the current situation. Thank you. You said you wanted something? Yeah, maybe I can pick up the Cuba question. So I think that the, the most important role that Cuba is playing today is in terms of military intelligence. Um, so the Cubans have been providing the Maduro regime with a lot of support on that front. So essentially internal intelligence within the military um, to try to basically prevent any sort of real rupture and the military turning on, on Maduro. And I would say in that regard, they've been extremely effective. So we saw last year a, a lot of military detentions. I mean, this is something that um, I mean, they've been able to identify potential um, challenges to Maduro. And I think in this conversation about getting the military to abandon Maduro, how does that happen, when, I mean, the coordination challenge is a real issue <laughs> because the Cubans are so effective that risking that type of coordinated effort against Maduro and having it go wrong, <laughs> Um, and having, and then having to pay the personal costs associated with that, it's just one more exit cost. Um, so I would say in terms of the Cubans' role, I think it's, it's been very critical, but it's particularly in, in terms of helping to contain, keep the military on side, and, and really prevent or at least deter the type of coordinated effort it's gonna take in order to, to really get regime change here. Thanks, Cynthia. Yeah. Cuba um, issue, if you could give your also, I, also on that, I, I how much control or decision making does Havana have in this process? Well, I totally agree uh, with this. I think it's more in the uh, uh, intelligence, and it's so important because the military is the failure of Maduro. So, uh, doing everything in order to avoid the fracturing site is, you know, life for the government of Maduro. So Cuba is helping him. I absolutely agree with it. And I agree that with uh, Michael about the, the story of negotiation and negotiation and dialogue, you know, in Venezuela is like a bad word right now for the people because they are so skeptical. The experience was absolutely awful for them. They, they want all, all of them and not negotiation. But, to be honest, I never am going to abandon the idea of negotiation. We cannot solve this problem without negotiation. The thing is that the negotiation is quite different than the things that we have done. We cannot say that as we failed in the past, the future of negotiation is condemned. This is, in my opinion, not correct. Uh, first of all, in order to have a negotiation, you have to have power of negotiation. You cannot go for a table of negotiation without having power. In the first time when the position went to the, to the table of negotiation, uh, uh, we saw the leaders of the position in the table of negotiation asking for the head of Maduro, uh, give me your you know, head, is the only Thing that we are looking for. We are not going to negotiate anything else except your head. So, perfect. If you are if you are asking for my head, what is the answer of Maduro? Okay, my head or what? And and, and this it was the problem at that time. I didn't have anything to press him to give the head. So of course they are going to lose. It was not a surprise. You know, if, if you analyze the situation at that time or now, it was clear that you were going to lose because you didn't have power of negotiation. You didn't have anything to press him to give the head of Maduro. And in the second, 
it was more or less the same. A little bit better in terms of power, but it was no different. Maduro did what he wanted because he had more power of negotiation than the opposition. And he played the game and manipulate the position and bought time. And it doesn't mean that in the future, you are going to do the same thing. In order to negotiate, you have to have the power. Anyway, what, what is, in my opinion, an uncertainty is not if we are going to negotiate. We are going to negotiate. The thing is, who is going to be the one? <laughs> is Maduro, is military, is the, the traditional Chavistas, the elite in power, uh, or is at the end the opposition negotiating with the United States to have a military intervention, which is a negotiation. Well. Everything is a negotiation. So negotiation is the key issue, in my opinion, because the last scenario that I mentioned, in my opinion, is the worst without negotiation. So why? Because, hey, if you don't negotiate with the military and you attack Venezuela, you are going to create a team of kamikaze inside. Maybe you can destroy them. It's a possibility. But it's just a scenario because the other one is that you go there and leave me a huge problem, which is uh, you know, group, paramilitary groups, uh, armed groups, uh, um, the pranis, the chief of the jail, uh, controlling regions in Venezuela without any control, it could happen if, if I don't negotiate with the guys. So again, uh, my, my, my thing is, I am sure that we need to negotiate. Maybe I agree with, with, with Mike, and maybe the negotiation has to be after, but it could be. But you have to plan the negotiation. Even if you are going to do something before, you have to be absolutely clear that you are going to negotiate. And this is difficult, especially inside. Because after you win, the, the group of people who win is not exactly the same able to negotiate after. We have to count the pasta before. Everyone before cooking it. Because after everything could happen, and we can have a mess in Venezuela. Thank you. Uh, we're going to negotiate at the end of this session. Uh, no, we, we have some questions. I'm going to take a round of questions and then I'll give it back to the panel. But ask if you agree. We'll start with my friend in the back there. Since it's uh, <clears throat> Black History Month, I'm interested in knowing about the plight of Afro Venezuelans and whether or not. Guido has manifested any uh, affirmation with respect to creating an inclusive environment in which Afro-Venezuelans can also participate in the process. And Michael, I hope that in the meetings that you will be participating, that you assume the responsibility of ensuring that there is equity in representation. Because Venezuela has shown a bad habit of manifesting strong racism. Thank you. You've been very patient here. Let's just get to it. Hi, my name is uh, Frank Sager. I'm from the uh, International Finance Corporation, I see as part of the bank group. I'm curious about the day after. For all the right reasons we're talking about today, and how do we get there? But Carlos set us out by saying, oh, and when you look at the oil industry, the revival of uh, private sector job creation, you need enormous amounts of investment. You might have referred to pay flag in the I believe. New institutions, new rules of the game. From a private sector perspective, the last 20 years have been probably the antithesis of sanctity of contract. And there were lots of there must be, and I wonder what your perspective is, how it would play out. Risa, I especially look at you, curious. There must be so many claims on contracts. There must be so many demands on the system before you can actually establish an environment where investment, whether it's Venezuelan investment that has left, or foreign direct investors come back into the country, that I'm not quite sure how to start it. What do you see? How do you think this plays out? 
Thank you. Sir, you have a question. Thank you very much, Emiliano Gosto from the Swiss Public Radio. Um, you haven't focused too much on the role of the U.S. We heard something at the very end. I was wondering, um, the fact that the President Trump recognized Mr. Guaido in few minutes, really in few minutes, the White House put out the statement, you remember, a few days ago. And now in perspective, we heard many times that all the options are on the table. And here we are hearing about you know, negotiations, dialogue, trying something. Aren't you, in a way, let me say, afraid that an external actor, very important, of course, the US, can disrupt something that at the local level, at the domestic level, is going on? Briefly, second point, is this humanitarian assistance program really humanitarian, or could it be a beginning of something else? Thank you. Thank you, yes. Yeah. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, I am a Venezuelan citizen, and I'm a fellow I am a gas expert, okay? I'm coming from Middle East. Luis, it's a pleasure to meet you here, and also Rose and, and Michael, okay? I would like to do this question in Espanol, but let's do it in English. Uh, Luis, you mentioned a very important aspect. You said that you know one of the key points is to take the negotiation as a value. But we are going to see from the military aspect, or from the oil and gas aspect, I can tell you from the fact that we're going to see an imminent oil and gas collapse. We have 700,000 barrel production today, more or less, and with this sanction, maybe, this will go down and down and down. My, my worry as a, as a Venezuelan, and then as a human, because we're human in this country. What will happen in front of the army in, te in terms of the negotiation, seeing the country diminishing every day with the oil coming down, 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 the process is going to be deteriorated every day. In order to get the army, the rationale to do what they have to do to restate the democracy in the country. What do you think would be the aspect on that? Thank you. Yes. Got a microphone next to you. Hola, Douglas Castro, de la Alianza Cívica de Nicaragua. Mi pregunta es que, en el caso del ejército, Guaidó está hablando de una amnistía, pero también existe el temor desde el chavismo de que realmente esas amnistías no sean muy válidas porque hay procesos de la justicia internacional que están caminando, no se puede fallar. El segundo, para Luis Vicente, es que cuál es el riesgo de que la oposición se quiebre porque Guaidó asume, pero dentro de tres días tiene que llamar a elecciones. Y cuando eso se rompa, ¿qué va a suceder? Okay. I think I saw another question back there, ¿no? Yes. Yeah. Two questions back there. One for you, then go back to our. Hi, my name is my name is Janice Sanchez, um, Venezuela, and I work as an independent consultant. So my question is about the opposition. I would like to hear from Luis Vicente León, who has like the information like their press and the ground. So um, days uh, ago, some days ago, I was talking about three political parties of the opposition that were thinking about not recognizing why though if after 30 days he couldn't call for elections. So this was said not only by CNN in Spanish, but also it was confirmed by Almagro. So in this case, I would like to hear from you about what the unity of the opposition, is they're really united towards achieving this democratic transition, or there are some fights within the process. Great, thank you. Fidel? Thank you, my name is Fidel Marquez. Uh, very briefly, um, what are the chances that instead of following the opposition software, the armed forces decide uh, to follow its own agenda and uh, propose an alternative government, not one led by Maduro, but a similar Chavista force? What are the chances that they may be making calculations of their own and not be willing to endorse someone from the opposition like uh, uh, Guaido. Thank you. Thank you. Very briefly, and we'll end with you, but very briefly, two seconds, now we have to go back to it. <laughs> very briefly. Okay, thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Timothy Tallow, 30 years in the State Department. That's the positive side. The negative political officer, all dictatorships in the last century uh, and two years in Havana, Cuba, Gary Mariel. My question is basically for you. You talked about that the, uh, the Chavistas are really not cranked up politically in doing something, and the military is a little slow in reacting. Would you talk more about, you call them paramilitary, 
I call them thugs and gangsters who kick indoors, beat up women, women are equal now, and behave badly with Cubans, I lived in Cuba, with Cubans advising them how to do it. How do you deal with those nasties? And as for Cuba, which I know a bit about, I'm delighted to know that Europe, far, far away, is paying attention to this hemisphere. Hooray! Why not the Europeans who love to go to Havana in boats, in airplanes, spend a lot of money and get skin cancer, why can't the Europeans be encouraged to talk to the Cubans about look out or they'll make less money from those guys way over there? Thank you very much, Ambassador. Let's start with the present day then, and with my Great questions, except for the last month's <laughs> Well, um, uh, the, the role uh, of the United States, of course, it's a, you know, the main role in the international community. The international community is so important in terms of elevating the cost of the status quo. But of course, the United States has the, you know, the most important role because we are dependent, our economy is dependent on oil and it's dependent on the United States. So it's clear that everything that the United States could do in order to press the, 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 the value of government is going to be the key issue here. And, and they play Absolutely, and, and the compromise of President Trump with the uh, Venezuelan situation is it's surprising, yes. As Michael said, no, no surprise that it's important. It's surprise that the, the level that, the, that it took for you know, his speech, Penn's speech, Bolton, and whatever. It's, it's incredible high, and it's so important for the opposition. And uh, going to the, to the uh, um, humanitarian uh, thing, uh, of course, we need help. And, and a lot of people in Venezuela uh, need help. Uh, but the humanitarian issue here is a breaking point as well. Uh, because uh, look at the embassy conflict. When Maduro decided to kick the embassy of the United States out and gave him three days to go away, it was clear that it was impossible. The no, United States didn't recognize Maduro. Why do not recognize the United States diplomatics? How can do Maduro attack the guys and create a, you know, a war act and be intervening immediately because he's attacking the diplomatic of the United States? It's not going to happen. Uh, but it's a, you know, one lose. But the second is, what is going to happen if, for example, United States decide to you know, go to Venezuela with the humanitarian help through the border of Colombia and Brazil, and the government of Maduro decide to stop them. How can they stop them? So they think they are allowed for Guaido, which is the president they recognize. If Maduro attack, then is what? No, it's exactly the same as the embassy. So, and can Maduro allow the Americans go in the territory everywhere to help people and create a, you know, like a light intervention. So for them, it has to be a dilemma. I don't know where it's going to happen, but it's a breaking point. It's not just humanitarian. It's a, it's a break, a political breaking point. Um, well, the, the negotiation uh, with, with the military, uh, again, I think it's so important negotiation include the military. And, and because you have to reduce the cost of exit. The, the problem is that it's easy to say that. We are here saying that we need to solve the problem with the military, reduce the cost of exit, create. No, it's easy to say that. What is difficult is to do it. No? Because again, the Cubans are absolutely involved. They are a spy. They are ironclad. Maduro knows perfectly the risk. They are absolutely following them and free. And you have to remember something important. We are not talking about the Maduro government. This is a military government. And the military participates in the government. It's not just Maduro. So you have to negotiate with the government of Venezuela, which is the military as important as Maduro. So it's not easy to imagine how are we going to do it? But what is clear 
is that if you want to negotiate with them, they have to, you know, to be sure that they are going to be protected. Otherwise, there is no any way to negotiate with them. If you can attack them and not negotiate with them if they are absolutely at home or close. Uh, with, the, um, with the political parties in the opposition, uh, I, I don't think there is a huge risk of division in the opposition right now. I, 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 look, look at this. Uh, my grandpa had a farm, and my uncle controlled it. My father went to Caracas, and he didn't care about it. When my grandpa dies, my, my sisters and I asked for the same lawyer, because we had to fight against our uncle for the hearse, because he wanted to control all the farm, because he worked the farm for you know, a long time. But in fact, in law, we had the right for the half of it. My sister and I were absolutely allies, asked for the same lawyer. We did the same strategy, and we won. As soon as we won, we start a fight. <laughs> because this 50% of the farm was not homogeneous. So we had a splendorous river, a wonderful house, and a piece of nothing that my sister wanted me to take. <laughs> you know, it's, it's so important to understand that unity depends on the you know, tension, objectives, and press. Right now, the uh, opposition is united, and it's united because all of them want Maduro out, and why not is you know, a wonderful way to obtain that. After, the day after, things change dramatically. Well, part of them are going to want an election in 30 days because they don't want Guaido to maintain power for a while. Because if Guaido becomes the most important leader in Venezuela and everybody loves Guaido, Guaido is going to be the most important candidate, even in front of Leopoldo Lopez, which is the coach and the leader of his political fight. Politics are that way. So we need changes immediately before this guy becomes the only guy in the future. And, and this is going to be, again, a lot of you know, differences after we finish this story. So maybe I can, maybe I can pick up the question about uh, an alternative Chavista or military government. I, I, I don't see what, what that resolves for the military or, or Chavismo at this point, because you still have the same issues of recognition, of international sanctions that aren't gonna be lifted without new elections, economic crisis, the streets, the unified opposition. So I think to me, that's not a sustainable alternative, and that means you basically stick with Maduro to the bitter end, or you really have more of a, a cool bit. On the, the day after question, which is a really good one, I mean, I think that Obviously, there is going to be a, a long process here in terms of, you know, to Michael's point about rebuilding the institutions. I mean, even before you get to an election, you have to rebalance the, the balance of powers of the institutions. You have to get new electoral uh, machinery and observers and the rest of it, right? I mean, this is going to be a, a, a long process. I assume that an eventual opposition government would need massive international support. <laughs> day, day one, probably, is, is seeking out multinational, multilateral support. Um, and they're going to have to renegotiate the debts with everyone. So, I mean, the debts, the universe of debts is very complicated. It's over $160 billion between bondholders, international arbitration claimants, bilateral creditors, and then the commercial paper, which is, you know, the oil service providers, um, even from the, the old way now, multiple foreign exchange systems ago. Um, debts that the government has. So that's going to be very complicated. You have to basically negotiate with, with everyone. Um, but I would imagine that conversation would take place with hopefully a, a big backstop and, and support in terms of the technical side, in terms of, of financing. The, 
the oil sector, I mean, rebuilding that is is going to be challenging, um, especially just the the infrastructure deterioration, um, human capital flight that we've seen. I mean, it's going to be a, a huge challenge. The estimates, you know, in terms of even stabilizing production that I've heard for investment requirements are around 10 billion. Increasing production is probably double that. But that's also now, right, and before the impact of sanctions. So, I mean, that hole could be bigger depending on how much production gets hit by the, the current sanctions and, and how long this drags out. I will say, I mean, I, I think that there's a lot of Western oil companies, the super majors that have been, um, you know, they were burned by, by, by Chavez. They, I don't see them coming back anytime soon. But there are some some very competent European companies. Um, there's one American company still there um, that are already there, that already have the relationships, and I would imagine would kind of lead the recovery effort to at least start to stabilize production before, I think it's a much longer process for new money to start coming back into, into the sector and into the, the economy more broadly. Thanks, Richard. Michael, give me the final word. Thank you. Uh, let me start with Frank's um, question. Um, recovery, and Venezuela needs to reignite growth. And that's what Venezuela needs to start growing in order to address um, the social issues that are at hand that are growing. Um, but Venezuela, not only, I mean, as Riza said, you have an institutional challenge. You need you need to solve that. Be credible. But Venezuela has three great opportunities, two great opportunities, and one important challenge. Given what we've lived through in the last about twenty years. First of all, we can leverage on oil. I mean, you have an oil sector, um, and um, and there are great opportunities there. Um, even under the current framework, um, you could you could work with that framework. Um, to stabilize and bring production back to where it was. Um, growing, you know, increasing production beyond where it was in 1998 probably will require some adjustments. Okay, but, but, but you have that, that, that opportunity there. You need to leverage um, in a way, again, that is institutional, institutionally sound and that is politically consented by all actors, because otherwise you're going to fear, you know, reversals of contracts um, tomorrow. So, so, but you have that. Second difference is, unlike other debt problems throughout Latin America, the private sector in Venezuela is not leveraged. It flew, it left the country, but it's not leveraged. In fact, there's no leverage because we've had a exchange rate controls for now 15 years. Okay. Now we don't know exactly what we have at this point, but <laughs> something really weird what's going on. But 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 that means that the private sector has room to respond. Okay. That what does that well, but but what is it the private sector gonna require? It's gonna require being able to access international financing. And that's where I think institutions like the IFC are absolutely key in order for not only attracting investment, but even to restore trade financing, um, which is basic in order to recover a production based on, 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 on the installed capabilities that the country has. But that's, that's an opportunity. Where is the challenge? And I've insisted this with many friends who you know I share a, this discussion that you know have worked on on very good programs and ideas. Where is the biggest challenge? The biggest challenge is that we have an economy not only that it is full of all sorts of controls, price controls, exchange rate controls, absurd regulation, but where state-owned enterprises are everywhere and they even control monopolies in key in key industries, cement, for example. Let's say you want to you know, start construction in Venezuela. Well, you're gonna find out very soon that there's only one company of cement which is in the, it's in the hands of the government, and that it's almost broken, and it's not producing anything. Well, you go to other sectors, 
sectors. Um, you go to mining sector, you go to a agriculture, you're gonna find the same. So, so we need to come up with a framework to deal with this, which is gonna be, on, on the one hand, you need to reverse a lot of these expropriations that were not compensated, that were expropriated. But on the other hand, you're gonna have to work with PPPs, okay, with private-public partnerships, in order to, to bring some of these companies back through different schemes that are transparent, because there's a huge risk here, a huge risk if this is not done appropriately. Okay. I'm not gonna go into this, but I think these are the three key factors. Going back to your excellent question, I think it's absolutely key. We need inclusive institutions in Venezuela, inclusive in, in every sense of the word, okay? Politically, socially, economically. I think this is where the country needs to build these kinds of inclusive institutions. Chavez came to power in 1998 because people were fed up with corruption and they were fed up with issues of equality and inequality, okay? Well, let me tell you, corruption is much worse than what it was in 1998. And inequality, incredibly, is even, you know, it's, it's the worst situation that we've ever gone through, basically because of hyperinflation. We have poverty now that is over 84%. Extreme poverty over 45%. Well, but inequality is something that is just a, a important to address, okay? Guaido, I think, has been able to connect with popular sectors, and this is something that has the government very worried. Um, why? Well, because he, he comes from a town close to Caracas, which is a port, which is a very popular sector. Um, he's a very simple guy who has studied. He went, he did, you know, he went to engineering school, he did his master's degree, so, and his grandfather was a military man. So he, he comes from that type of background, and, and he favors of social investment, um, and, and he's very much sensitive to that issue. Um, now, this is, this is key, um, because at the end, I think the social question is absolutely fundamental. If people don't perceive that this political change, if it happens, comes along with addressing these requirements, we're gonna have problems you know, moving ahead. On the final issue about you know, the, alter the alternative um, option, I agree with recent. Problem is, the problem with Venezuela right now is we are right now sitting on the top of a very irregular mountain. We need to come down there are very different paths to come down that mountain. But there's only one river, right? You, you, and in order to get out of the place, you have to go through that river. What does that river say? Well, first of all, there's no exit in Venezuela without a governability and alternability. So there's no way out without that. There's no way out without international financing. No way out. So in order to get international financing, all the international actors have to say, we agree with that political settlement or whatever political agreement. You require also to remove sanctions. Without those sanctions in place, it's very difficult to recover uh, the oil industry and even the private sector. Um, you need also um, to address a, basically a, the issue of the social emergency. So, and the social emergency is gonna require international donors to participate, so you have to satisfy those, 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 the demands from those groups in order to get the kind of support. What I'm trying to say is that at the end, the, the way how to get out of where we're stuck in this quagmire, which we've been now for quite a time, there's only one way out. Now, you can, create new options at the end, as, as Vicente was saying, well, there has to be a settlement. What is curious about Venezuela, and I'll end here, is that everyone, you know, Venezuela, you go to, Vicente is an excellent pollster, and 
And, you know, there's one thing that strikes me is that people are now talking about accords. People like the word accords because they don't like the word negotiation. So people understand that, you know, they, we need an accord. We need a, you know, a social accord. We need a political accord. How do you get there? Okay, how do you build that? But in order to build that, we need to make sure that we're, we're getting out of this quagmire and it's irreversible. We're not going back. And this is what the Venezuelan peoples are struggling. That's why they're struggling in the streets. Why? That's why they're.